This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. So it's the end of the summer. I'm feeling a little speed. And I'm going to reach back on the archives for two of my favorite episodes with two guys that know something about speed. Richard Noble, John Force. Richard Noble, Scottish entrepreneur. He was the holder of the land speed record between 83 and 97. He's the director of Thrust SSC. That's the vehicle that currently holds the land speed record. And for 2019, he will try to get over 1,000 miles per hour. My second guest in this nice archive combo episode, John Force. He's an American NHRA drag racer, 16-time funny car champion driver, and 20-time champion car owner. He is one of the most dominant drag racers in the sport with over 149 career victories. He is one of the most dominant drag racers in the sport with over 149 career victories. Come on, you got to admit, you're somewhat jealous. I mean, yes, you get to listen, but how much fun is this to be able to have such diverse guests on this show? I'm lucky every damn day of the week. Without further delay, let's jump right into my first episode with Richard Noble. Hey, listen, you got, I want to jump right in. You got a big uh, anniversary coming up here, so to speak. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah. 30th anniversary of the world land speed record. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I, I, I have two, I have my first question, because there's just not many people on the planet that have the feeling of going on the ground uh, over 600 miles an hour. And you've done it more than once. That's right. I've been over 600 miles an hour 11 times. Andy Green's been over, um, well, he's been over 700 miles an hour, of course, so uh, he's one up on me. So I'm still the second fastest on on Earth, so how's that? It's pretty good. Um, so I, my question, ha- from a novice standpoint, because I'm, I'm thinking of my exhilarations of speed, and they're very minor, uh, maybe on the highways outside of uh, Vegas going over 100, uh, maybe being on a small Gulfstream jet and getting to 45,000 feet very quick. That's about the extent of it. So so right. what, what does it feel? Can you even begin to describe 600 plus miles an hour, over a thousand kilometers per hour? Can you even begin to describe that to someone that has not sat in that seat where you sat? Yeah. <clears throat> I think the important thing to understand is it's not an emotional experience. Um, if you um, are looking for an emotional experience, if you're looking for a high, Michael, then um, then basically you're the wrong man for the job. The whole idea is to try and make it as boring as you possibly can so that you can concentrate entirely on what you're doing. And um, so if I take you through a, a thrust to run, uh, you'd start say, at the north end of the uh, of the Black Rock Desert. You've got a 13-mile track. Um, you've got a, a track width, which is just 50, 50 foot wide, and you've got to stay within that track. And um, you start the huge engine, the Rolls-Royce Avon 302. You start it up, and uh, you hold the car on the brakes with your left foot. All these cars are left foot braked. So you hold on the, uh, the, the brakes with your left foot, and then um, you wait for the aeroplane, which is flying up and down the track. Because remember, it, it's a long track. You can only see to the horizon, which is two and a half miles ahead. And the aeroplane is checking to make sure we haven't got anybody on the track. Once we know we're okay, um, we've got the signal to go, uh, then you hold the car on the brakes with the left foot. You accelerate the engine with the right foot to 92% of maximum RPM. If you go to 93%, it'll go with the wheels locked. So that's not very clever. So hold it there, do your last minute checks. Once you're okay, brakes off with your left foot, slam accelerate with your right foot, and aim to get into the afterburner within 30 feet. Uh, the sooner you get into the afterburner, the better, because uh, that gives you the big boost and, and the big power. Uh, you're running on aluminium wheels. 
Uh, you've got no towers, so directional stability is not good. So between naught and about 300 miles an hour, the car squirrels all over the place, and you've got to work really hard to keep the front wheels in front of the back wheels and keep the whole show within the lane. Because if you leave that lane, uh, you'll never get back into it again. So you have to walk the run. Um, so um, then you reach the sort of transition speed, which is about 300 to 350 miles an hour, when the thrust to um, fins really start providing the directional stability, which is great. So once you've got that, then the car seems to settle down quite a lot. And 350 to 550 is boring. It's very much the same thing, except uh, you're just going a lot faster. 550 starts to get really exciting because around then you see the shock wave build up on the intake, just above the uh, uh, just above the intake and the nose. A great white shock wave stands up there as the low airflow locally goes supersonic. And at 615, you get the same thing over the wheel arches because again the, the airflow is going supersonic there. And at these speeds, it becomes really, very interesting because I've been in a long time. And so consequently, your mental processes speed right up. And so everything happens in very, very slow motion. Uh, you've got plenty of time. You can see every single detail on the track come up and go under the car at 650 miles an hour. It's a very relaxed process. You go through the measured mile. And that's when the fun really starts because um, you've got to come back very, very gently on the throttle. You've got to cool the engine for three seconds, which seems like an eternity. And then, and only then, can you switch off the fuel to the engine and push the button on the steering wheel, which fires the par brake parachutes. And as soon as that comes out, um, you've got 6G deceleration, massive deceleration. So you're losing speed at 130-odd miles an hour per second. And you get an extraordinary effect called the somatographic illusion, uh, which upsets your inner ears and causes you to um, think as if you're driving straight down to the center of the earth. Uh, you've lost, at that point, you've more or less lost control of the car, but it doesn't matter because you've got the parachute on the back acting like a very big sea anchor, so it's holding you straight. So then you're down to uh, 400 miles an hour, and at 400 miles an hour, it seems so slow, you want to get out and walk alongside. And then finally, you're down to 200 miles an hour. You bring the wheel brakes in and uh, bring it to a halt. And then you reach across and get your notebook out and you write down everything um, you can possibly remember. And then very shortly, the uh, team is alongside you. And then we're ready to do either do a turnaround or to uh, take the car back to its, to its garage. So that's it, really, Michael. So I'm hearing in you, though, there's a, a lot of... It's all process. You're not really thinking about the outcome. You are worried about every process that you know has to be undertaken in the correct method. And then hopefully the outcome will, will be a, a higher speed uh, than maybe the last time, but it's all about process. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, if you're starting to get a high out of it, uh, then you're the wrong person. Uh, you'll be a risk to the, to, to the project. So it's, it's a job of a minor test pilot, I think is probably the best way of describing it. So I did see the uh, the headline though, and I think you're 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 famously quoted for this. That uh, why did you do this? And you said for Britain and for the hell of it. Now I, I imagine there's a little bit more to the story than that. <laughs> no, well, the interesting thing was that um, uh, we did this in the 1980s, and in the 1970s, Britain was in a terrible mess. The country was in a complete mess. We weren't succeeding at anything. It was a disaster. And it was really nice to be able to do something for the country and sort of really lift people's spirits. And uh, it got a really good reception. People were absolutely thrilled. And, of course, the, the Brits have a long association with the World Land Speed Record, really from, right through from the 1920s. And then in the 1960s, we built the wrong sort of car. And our good American friends took it away from us. <laughs> let, me, let me jump into something. This is something I talk in my podcast a lot. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is uh, the word entrepreneur. And I yeah. have I have a feeling that's near and dear to you, and probably just the uh, the fiber of you. So so when did you get this entrepreneurial bug? How did you know you had it? I don't know if it's a bug. Um, basically, what I got was a land speed record bug. Really, I was really interested in that. Really, since I was the uh, age of six, and there comes a time in line, Michael, time in life, Michael, when you suddenly decide, well, you know, if it really means so much to you. But again, do it. And then, of course, uh, you know, then it's a sheer battle to, uh, to try and convince people that, uh, that it's worth doing, that it's worth doing and worth putting resources in. And to, to get thrust to, uh, to the world land speed record, I mean, it, it took an awful long time, it took six years of hard work. Well, the whole program took nine years. 
and um, the efforts of about 200 companies. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an act of a desperate individual, I think, really. Okay, okay, okay. I, I got to step back. Six years old, desperate individual. I, okay, this is a little bit of British sarcasm here. So I, <laughs> what, what did you know at six years old? Why did you know this speed record at six? Well, it's a funny thing. Um, basically, we're talking about 1952. It's just after the war. Uh, Britain is a really boring place. There's nothing very interesting going on for a young kid to get excited by. And uh, my dad was in the army, and he was based up in Inverness in the north of Scotland. And one day he decided he'd take us for a drive. In those days, you went for a drive as, a, as, a, as, as entertainment. Today, you don't go for a drive for entertainment. But that's what you did in those days. And we drove around the north banks of Loch Ness, which is a really beautiful place. And we came to a place called Drum the Drocket, and there at the little pier um, was John Cobb's jet boat Crusader. And he was going for the world water speed record. And I saw this thing. And um, if you have a look at pictures on it on on, um, on Google, you'll see that, uh, you know, it's the most fantastic looking boat. I saw this and I just thought, wow, that is, that's really special. And then, I don't know, I suppose the bug bit, I started studying. I wasn't really interested in the water. But um, when I discovered there was a land speed record, which was a lot, lot faster, I then became really interested. And so I spent uh, my adult years really sort of studying this, buying all the books, reading, reading whatever I could on it. And then eventually, of course, comes to a point where you've got to go and do it. I just, I think, you know, it's such, it's inspirational. I mean, I, in a, in a different sort of way, I've, I've been an entrepreneur, but not at the, the high risk. I mean, it's risky in a way, but that I've done things, but not risky in a life threatening way. So, yeah. but you probably don't view the risk that you've taken as life threatening. Do you really? No, um, you're absolutely right. I think the thing that happens, the, the process is uh, is really very simple. What you do is you start an organization <laughs> to do it because it's a team thing. It's not an individual thing. It's a team thing. Um, you build up a fantastic relationship with the team, and uh, and your team operates on the basis that if they don't like what's happening, uh, they can walk away from it and leave it. And, um, and so there's a tremendous team eth eth ethos to get the thing right, to have thought it all through, to have done the research, and to get to a point where you believe you've, you've really got a very good, good chance of actually putting it off. And that's, that, that's the crucial thing. So you're part of an organization that's moving forward. You've done a massive amount of research. You've done a lot of development. And eventually, you know, the organization pops out the top with a world record, having developed both the driver and, of course, the car and the team. So let me let me follow up on this idea of higher risk and like I said not necessarily just in land speed records but the idea of higher risk in life and society today where I think society in many ways you see so many efforts to minimize risk and to me it seems like the other side of the coin it, it, it's almost a, it's a very fertile ground and so how how did you come to this idea about high risk having these rewards and being a space, a place that you want it to be in the high risk space, so to speak? I think it becomes really very interesting because, um, well, first of all, in terms of, uh, in terms of, sort of British society, I think, or British culture, uh, we've lost the risk. Um, we, we don't take risks anymore. And consequently, we don't go anywhere. And the converse of not taking risks is that we study history and we praise those who did take risks way back in history. So we're going through a sort of phase in Britain where we're praising um, all the old inventors and the people who fought in World War II and so on and so forth. Pretty soon we're going to run out of material for that one. <laughs> uh, but it's very, it's very, very interesting. So consequently, we don't take risk. And because we don't take risk, we don't advance at all. Um, we need people um, like Steve Jobs, um, who, you know, was, was just absolutely the outstanding entrepreneur of his decade, his time. It's very difficult to... Um, to get people to work like that and understand that. And so with our organization, um, and for instance, in Bloodhound, we have 60 people working. We've got to develop a, a risk culture where people are quite happy to take risk and are encouraged to take risk. And it becomes very interesting. The, um, it takes people about three or four months to sort of change from being um, working in a hierarchical organization where they're told what to do to working into one of our organizations where they decide what they're going to do. You know, I've seen some comments that you've made talking about security and people's desire for comfort. And I think if you focus only on security and comfort, 
you maybe miss one of the most important things in life, which is passion. You're waking yep. up, waking up each day and saying, let's go take it on. And I mean, you're a great example of that. You wake up every morning and say, how the hell are we going to get through today, Michael? <laughs> yeah, but that's still a great feeling, right? I mean, who wants to wake up? Yeah, and just, I think what is a great feeling is that when you start a day and you think, oh, my God, how the hell are we going to get through this? We've got so many problems and so many difficulties. And then somewhere along the line, something magic happens. And one of these magic people says, yeah, we're going to join. We're going to be part of you. And that is a fantastic moment. So for all the months of crap and difficulty and hassle and time, just occasionally you meet these amazing people. And uh, there was uh, there is one person at uh, Rolls-Royce who decided that uh, Rolls-Royce was going to sponsor the project. And I, I went to this meeting and I was told everything was going to turn to ashes and, uh, you know, we had to open hell. And the man just hit the table with his fist and said, right, we're doing it, and committed the whole of Rolls-Royce, which is just brilliant. So... Just occasionally, you're very fortunate to meet these people. Okay, but but when when you're in that room, and I know you've talked about this too, the idea of your your passion requires uh, capital. So, what are some of the things that you've learned about motivating people to get them to come over to your perspective? Right. Well, we don't. Let's get that right. We don't have any capital, Michael. It's uh, it's a big mistake. <laughs> capital means shareholders. Uh, capital means banks, and uh, and that's where the problems start. Because uh, if you're running a very high risk program like, uh, for instance, like Bloodhound or Thrust SSC or Thrust 2, um, the shareholders get very frightened but, because they've, they've never really been in situations which uh, we find ourselves in. And so you don't watch shareholders. So basically, it's a revenue business and uh, you've simply got to make the money every month. It's as simple as that. And there's never, I mean, I've, I've seen this also in your writings too. The idea, I see it in America. I'm seeing actually uh, quite a bit of the entrepreneurial zeal in Asia all this year, but, and you're mentioning it a little bit in Britain, the idea of giving up, and I know it's kind of retracking on some of the things that I've already brought up, but how, how can we, I mean, just in our simple little conversation here, how, what, what can I get, what can I get you to trigger on that can get people to understand why you don't give up? Why do you not give up? Well, let's give an example. <clears throat> we had a fascinating situation with the Thrust SSC car, which was eventually the first car to break the sound barrier. And we were building this car. We'd done all the research. Um, we'd done all the research on the car. Um, we'd done rocket testing. We, we were the first ever to use computational fluid dynamics to look at the aerodynamics. And basically, we then had a portfolio of documentation which showed that we could do it. It was going to be safe. And at that time, all the big companies in Britain were promoting themselves as being wonderful and brave and uh, entrepreneurial and all the rest. So, um, you know, I went around to see them all with all this, and they just ran away. They were absolutely terrified of it, um, which is really very sad because, of course, you know, at that stage, we already held the world land speed record. We were probably the best to do this, and um, they weren't going to back us. What did they say? Why, why were they terrified? What did they say, Richard? Well, they saw the risk. Um, they, 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 all they could view, all they could imagine was uh, a terrible car crash and the last piece of bodywork having their logo on it. I, I think that's as far as it goes. So what do you do? Well, if you've got something that's as valuable as that, in other words, the research, the, exp um, you know, uh, you, you've just got to go and do it, haven't you? To hell with all the rest of them. You've just got to get on and do it. And somewhere along the line, providing you keep battling, batting away, um, you'll find a few like-minded individuals and um, gradually you build an organization that can do it. That's what it's done. But all the way down the line, great difficulties with the, the British culture, great difficulties uh, with the big companies who wouldn't support it. And uh, and we still have that trouble too with that time. You know, it's funny. I, I had a chance to become friends with a, a gentleman who runs one of the largest hedge funds in Britain um, yeah. And a guy named David Harding. And it was interesting when I'd have conversations with him, he kind of cited and I'm not trying to be political here, but he cited some American work, specifically uh, the, the novel Atlas Shrugged and just talking about that kind of go for it entrepreneurial attitude. And he was he somewhat was very similar to you in expressing uh, the the culture of Britain and how he was able to kind of pull himself out of it, which I think was one of the secrets to his success as well. I think that I, I think there's got to be a lot of parallel. Uh, Michael certainly has, uh, because basically, um, the, the, also you know, the culture extends to the media, and this was an extraordinary experience we had. Was that um, 
having done all the research on the car, on the, and now here we're talking about the thrust SSC car, so we're talking uh, 1992, 93, the, uh, the only way we can finance this is via sponsorship, and sponsorship requires, of course, a lot of media coverage, so you've got to get out and get the media coverage in order to uh, generate the interest, in order to generate the money to build the car. So that's the sequence. Suddenly all our media coverage stopped, um, and I couldn't understand this. I mean, this is a fantastic situation. You're building the world's first supersonic car. You've got a real chance of pulling this thing off. And suddenly all your media coverage stops. So I got in the car and I raced around to see a whole lot of editors and anybody who'd see me and the BBC and all the rest. And um, the result of all these meetings was fascinating. They simply said, um, do you know, they said, it's too complicated for us. It's niche engineering. It's high technology. Our, our readers won't understand this, um, you know, and uh, it's, so therefore it's not for us. Um, but they said, when the thing starts to run, when you start to run that car with all the noise and the flame and um, violence and everything else, uh, we'll be there for you. But uh, during the build, that's not for us. Uh, so consequently, you know, our business plan was, uh, was a complete mess. We didn't know what the hell to do. And uh, we were saved by the Digital Corporation of America who came around the corner and said, uh, we're looking for um, show websites. This was 1992. <laughs> and I said to them, what's a website? And they explained it. I thought, well, that's really interesting. It's a one-to-one -one communication. That's what we should do. We'll open a new front. We'll bypass conventional media. So we started putting a website together with the digital guys, and they were really interested and very, very helpful. And uh, they started promoting it all over the world. And we didn't know what to do with this website, what to put on it. So we started getting the engineers and everybody in the team to write and it write on the website and explain what was going on and what they were doing and, and how they were tackling their day-to-day -day problems. And, uh, uh, and, and so that was what we did. We got a series of blogs there. And then suddenly this thing, the website took off big time, started to grow at an enormous rate. And we could then do something that the BBC could, couldn't do at that stage, which was go into the website and interrogate it and find out what they were all reading. And, Michael, what they were reading was the technical pages. <laughs> and this is absolutely amazing. So uh, we said, right, well, let's give them as much technical stuff as we possibly can. So we gave them 800 pages of technology on the project. And uh, the website grew to be the fifth largest in the world, bigger than all motorsport, football, all the rest. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And, uh, and, of course, the old conventional media is 180 degrees out of phase. You know, they're, they're doing the wrong thing. Public absolutely love technology. The public loves details, and I've seen this in my world, too, explaining the nitty-gritty of my world. But you're right, and I have, I've had very parallel experiences with the web, and traditional media just wants to give these general headlines, uh, assuming that the, the masses are, 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 are essentially ignorant fools or just have no interest or, or no knowledge or, or no desire. But then you Michael, go ahead. You're, you're so right. You're absolutely right. Uh, they dumb down in, in order to, and it's a dumbed down culture, in order to uh, hope to get the masses. Uh, the massive audience, but they're going the wrong way. But they don't. They don't risk it. They don't change. But what's nice is about in your experience too is you find you you, you think okay, I have this niche world as defined by major media. However, when your niche world is exposed to uh, free distribution, i.e., the internet, all of a sudden you find that your niche is filled with some very powerful, passionate people. Absolutely, absolutely, and of course, a lot of people, an awful lot of people, in the wrong jobs who've got real interests in other in other fields and, and so on and want to share them. So, um, you know, it's a great privilege. It really is. Well, let me let me as we wind down here, let me let me ask, where is everything right now? You're getting we're getting you. I know you you want to break. You want your team to break a thousand miles an hour. Is that is that is that the is that, 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 that that's where we are? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where does it all where does it all stand? What what deadlines are we looking at? What, where where is everything stand right now? Well, it was an extraordinary story, the whole thing. And perhaps I'd better spend a few minutes sure, on it, Michael, to, sure. you know, to explain. Um, what actually happened was um, Andy Green had driven Thrust SSC, and I'd led the project. And together, we'd broken the sound barrier, and we were very, very proud of that, that achievement. Interestingly, it did got um, uh, no response from the government in Britain. Andy got a, a, a medal of some sort, but there was nothing for the engineers or anything, which made, made me really sick, you know. Because it was a phenomenal team achievement. I mean, it really was. Anyhow, so um, then what happens is Steve Fossett, the late and very great Steve Fossett, decides he's going to uh, go for the world land speed record. 
And he represents a real challenge to us because uh, Steve, of course, he's no longer with us, but he had the money, the resource, the determination, motivation, the lot. He could do this. So Andy and I decided what we would do is rather than wait and see what Steve would get up to is to uh, kind of head him off at the pass and uh, create the ultimate car. So that's what we set out to do. We agreed with Ron Ayres, who's the aerodynamicist, without Ron, we go nowhere, uh, that uh, the, the term, the peak speed or the record speed we'd head for is a thousand miles an hour, Mach 1.4. And of course, uh, you know, this was met with incredibility by the aerospace community in Britain. Because, I mean, you know, this, this car goes 200 miles an hour faster than our best fighter at, uh, at 3,000 feet. So we are actually going to be positioned, same position as the, as the industry was in the 1920s, when actually the cars went faster than the airplanes. So that's, that's all real interesting stuff. Anyhow, we had our, um, uh, Andy fixed up a meeting with um, a minister um, in the Ministry of Defence responsible for all the purchasing. We had this great meeting, and our objective was to um, chat him up and separate him from a, um, a very modern jet engine called an EJ200. Uh, it didn't go very well, Michael, and uh, it was a very friendly meeting, but when I asked the minister of the engine, there was a terrible silence. Um, he didn't really see that coming. But what he did was he gave us an incredible lead, and he said, look, um, we have a real problem in the Ministry of Defence. We can't recruit engineers because there aren't any. We said, what? He <laughs> said, yeah, there are no engineers. Uh, it seems that what had happened was that the media had had sort of focused on the soft stuff for so long. In other words, that's basically the singing and the dancing and the cooking and all that stuff for so long uh, that the kids had sort of lost sight of the really exciting um, bits of life. And uh, the minister went on to say that uh, during the Cold War area, era, um, basically, everybody was producing these fantastic aeroplanes, and we produced, you know, the Concorde and the Lightning and the, uh, and the Vulcan Bomber and the TSR-2 and everything, fantastic products. And the kids would see them flying over because, of course, uh, you know, this was a wartime activity and all these things were out on sorties. And they were wildly inspired by, by, by what was going on. And that resulted in a steady supply of, of, of uh, scientists and engineers. So the interesting thing here was the minister then said to us, tell you what, he said, what I want is an iconic project like yours run through every school in the country to create us a new generation of scientists and engineers. And uh, so this seemed to me the only way we could make the minister happy. So I shook his hand and told him we'd do it. We then started studying all this and we came across this fantastic graphic which shows um, the huge surge in um, conferring of PhDs in the U.S., from 1962 to 72, it sort of grew by a factor of about 300%, massive growth. And that was almost certainly linked directly with the uh, U.S. manned space program, uh, otherwise known, you know, of course, as the Apollo effect. And so we decided we'd uh, try and work along these lines. And it's been hugely successful, Michael. We now have uh, 5,400 schools in Britain on it. We've got over probably about 2 million school kids studying it. So it's going to create a very large number of engineers. And in the U.S., you have exactly the same problems. And in a, a lot of uh, countries around the world, you know, the media have been doing the same thing and thus not giving the, the kids any real sort of inspiration at all. It's all been this virtual fakery. Anyhow, so um, that's one side of it. And that meant, therefore, that our, our sponsors got um, uh, CSR benefits, corporate and social responsibility benefits, um, which are very important to them. And uh, we went through an enormous phase of research, which took 55 man years using three of the largest high performance computing clusters in Europe, thanks to our good friends at, at Intel who made all this possible. And now we're into the build of the car. Um, and we're about sort of about halfway through. So if you went to the workshop now, you, you'd see it's beginning to look like a car. Very difficult program. Uh, we did get the jet engine in the end, thanks to Rolls Royce. We've also had to develop our own rocket motor, so this is a huge program. It's all it's all really coming together. We're going to have the car in um, quarter two, 2015. Um, we've also cleared an entire desert in South Africa. So we've got a 12-mile a run there, which is, I think, probably one of the best in the world. So all that's done. We're, um, our sponsor, our local South African sponsor, MTM, is putting up the huge 200-foot radio mast now, so we can take the data from the car and uh, 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 connect it straight up into the Internet. So around the world, all the schools can get all the data from the car each time it runs, uh, and they can study it. So it's going to create an enormous number of scientists and engineers worldwide. At the moment, we're in 220 countries, 
Uh, the only countries we're not in, as far as I make out, are North Korea, which is what you might expect, and uh, Vatican City. So that's a bit surprising, but there we go. You know, I, I love the idea that uh, that maybe maybe some of the passion and engineering uh, uh, that has disappeared in the last couple of decades that you're trying to bring back, you, you, you seemingly laid it right at the feet of boy bands. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, so you know. So you're telling you're, you're telling me that boy bands are not good uh, for for males that are looking to become engineers, even uh, ladies that want to become engineers. Boy bands are just the downfall of society, perhaps. Absolutely, I don't see the connection. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think maybe if they could be eliminated, that'd be a good thing. Hey, listen, I'm gonna let you, I want to <laughs> let you wrap up here. What is it? Because for people, I know people are gonna listen and they're gonna want to kind of check out what you're doing, uh, get involved, yeah. read, maybe even make some donations. So, where is the best place where they can start the website, the main spot, Richard? Yeah, the main spot is the website um, www.bloodhuntssc.com. And there's an awful lot of material on there. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, et cetera. But the, um, the main thing is the website. And uh, we're also starting a reciprocal website called Blast, which will in due course enable people to upload their own material and uh, communicate with each other. So uh, it's going to be a big international thing. We're going to be operational in 2015 uh, when we want to go supersonic and 2016 when we want to get to our thousand. That's the plan. It won't work out like that, but that's the plan. Well, I think it's I think it's awesome, and I think uh, for anybody out there that's wandering around saying uh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I I don't know what to do. I think sometimes you just you just got to wake up and say, you know, you said as a six year old boy, a lot of people have dreams when they're little kids, and for whatever reason they let go of them. Maybe society dumbs them down, society scares them. Uh, yeah. But I think it's really nice for people to hear from someone like yourself to say, hey, all that stuff is nonsense. You've got to follow your passion. You've got to follow your dreams. And if you don't, you could be one of those guys sitting on the couch at 70 years old going, what did I do for the, what did I do during my life? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. That's exactly it. Yeah. Well, listen, hey, it was, it was great having you on today. And uh, I look forward to following uh, your pursuit of the record. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate this. It was a great fun conversation. And um, thank you again. Take care. And now for part two of my speed episode, American drag racing champion, John Force. I hope you enjoy. John, as I go through your background, and we're going to dig a little deep today, but I want to know right off the top, big picture, why you? What has propelled you? What is the drive? All these decades later, you're at the top of the field. What is the drive, John? What's the secret? We can, we can translate your secret to all different types of walks of life. What drives you? Number one, we all want to make a living. We got to eat. You know, at the end of the day, I truly love doing what I do. I love NHRA drag racing. I have great sponsors. I love to drive my race cars. And at my age, I'm 68 years old. I can still drive. It's not like NASCAR. You know, all of the days are long, trust me, but you're not in the seat of that car for three hours straight. We got cars that run 300 miles, 330 miles an hour and in and, and, and less than, uh, you know, four seconds. But it's long days, engine building, taking care of the fans, doing promotions. It's a long day. But at the end, it, it's magic to me. I love driving these cars. NHRA Drag Racing's P.T. Barnum on the road, and we live on the road year-round. As a novice, as most of us are, I mean, there's very few people on this planet that are going to experience what you experience sitting at that starting line four seconds later, 330 miles an hour plus. Try and give the audience some perspective as you're sitting there at the starting line, because I've seen you say the, the races are won and lost right there at the starting line. What is going on? Give give a piece of that feeling at the beginning, during the race, the thrill, the excitement. Try and give a picture, a story for what this might feel like. Well, first of all, you're talking two cars racing side by side. We race in what they call the funny car ranks. My daughter, two of my daughters and my son-in-law race in the funny cars like myself, and I have a daughter that races top fuel. You're talking about a car that's 10,000 horsepower, runs nitromethane, has a 12-man crew that take care of it between rounds, tear it apart, put it back together. And then they give you this hot rod to go to the start line. Nitromethane belching out of the pipes. You know that it's a, a three to four second run. My family just ran, Robert and Courtney both ran three, 
38, I think, last week in 337 in Topeka. We're talking about going from a dead stop, more horsepower, one race car, 10,000 horsepower, then the whole front row. In fact, the whole field at NASCAR is more horsepower than all their cars put together. And then a driver has to react. He's wearing fire gear. He's strapped in. Uh, you know, races are won or lost on the reaction to a Christmas tree. That's why you got to keep yourself fit. I'm heading to the gym tonight. Keep yourself in good shape. Keep the mind responding because your because your whole future's out there in front of you. And uh, and when you hit that throttle, all hell breaks loose. And that car can leave the start line, shake it so bad it can knock you out. It can carry the front end for three, four hundred feet. You know it can set you on fire. You know that it can put you over the guard rail. Uh, I had a, a young kid that drove for me years ago that was killed in, in uh, 05, 07. I crashed the same year. I was in the hospital for, for six weeks uh, in rehab, uh, just getting back where I could come back and win. And I've won two or three championships since, since then. Everything's out there, the pressure, the sweat. Uh, I've got a lot of experience. I know how to handle the pressure, and even sometimes it gets me. But it's really the joy of it, of the, uh, of, the, of the heat of battle, being one with your race car. There can be a guy in the next lane you're racing. There can be a woman over there. A lot of women have evolved into our sport, not like NASCAR, uh, where they have a few, or, or IndyCar, uh, where they have a few. Uh, we have a lot of women over here in all the categories. So and they do real good. Uh, they win races. My daughter, Ashley, was the first to ever win in a fuel funny car. And now, of course, Courtney's winning a ton of races. Pressure, stress, fear, all rolled into one. Yeah, but there's victory at the other end in that wind light. You step on that gas and you ride her out. And the parachutes come in at the end of that racetrack. You know you're either alive or if it catches on fire, you go into fight mode. You go into fight mode to hit the fire bottles, to get on the brakes, get the parachutes out. Because the only friend you got at that time is yourself, and you're waiting for a safety safari uh, in HRA to come get you. They're the only ones at the end of the line that's left to pull you out of a burning car. I, I paint a picture of it negative, but you ask what you think about. You really think about cutting the light, winning the race, getting the car from A to B, through tire shake, wheel stand, whatever it takes to get there. But all that other stuff is out there because we always joke not because I'm sponsored by Monster Energy, uh, my daughter's car. Uh, I'm sponsored by Peak Motor Oil and, and Roberts with Auto Club and, and, and Courtney's with Advanced Auto Parts, and we're always Chevrolet. But Matt Poole, all these sponsors that pay PPG, they want you to win at the end of the day. So that is your priority, but in the end, you got to be, in case that monster jumps up in the front seat with you, and I don't mean the drink you drink, I'm talking about a fireball or an explosion or a or whatever takes place, or the two race cars run into each other. That's even happened. You know, John, as I, as I listen to you talk, you know, there's a certain, I think for most Americans listening, there's a certain cowboy attitude. But when it comes to the race, the preparation, the checklist, John Force has a system, and you follow that system like crazy, don't you? Well, you live by it. I mean, you know, we've lost some drivers out here over the years. It's going to happen. You can get run over by a trash truck. They call us heroes and superstars, but we're not like the men and women in the, in the military and the Army, Navy and Air Force and Marines and National Guard. Those guys go to work every day, just like the police and firemen, knowing that they, they have to be the first responders. They got to be there to save lives. We do this, number one, to win a race. We do it because we love it. And we do it to entertain the fans and sell products. That's what it's all about. But we also know what's out there, and it can get ugly. But we do it because we love it. You know what I'm saying? We, we're like a fireman. We'll, we'll jump through a burning window. You know what I mean? To hear the cheer of the crowd. A little pathetic. Firemen have to do it. Military have to do it. We don't. We do it because we, we love it, but they love what they do, and that's saving lives. We do it to put on a show. And every now and then, we need our own life saved. Hell, I've lasted over four decades, and uh, in, like in any sport, somebody can get hurt. This sport of NHRA, I believe, is really is a safe sport. Let me ask you, I'm curious, because I think in my world, there's so much talk of system. You know, having your, your process that you follow all the time. Now, you don't have enough time in our short conversation today. You know, we're going to be under an hour. We don't have enough time to explain everything that has to happen when you sit in the cockpit. But give people a broad overview of how you go down the checklist of getting everything done right 
before you hit the gas, before the Christmas tree comes down. Give people a sense of that. There's, there's a lot of steps, isn't there? You've heard of a golfer that loses his swing. You've got to be in the zone. You've got to go in there when you're pulling up to put on that first bulb to pre-stage, then stage, and then react to the amber. You don't want to wait for green or you're late. The bottom line is you go into a zone where you don't think about nothing. You take all the fear out of it. Your deal is to focus on that light, know that that car's straight, know that you've got to hit that throttle on time, and you've got to make magic. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe in your team, and that's how you get the job done. I've got almost 150 wins. I've got 16 championships myself, 18 as a team owner, but I'm trained. I've always joked I'm trained like a monkey. You know what I mean? You could train a monkey to drive this hot rod if he did it for four decades. And, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he could give a good interview as me, but bottom line, you, you train yourself to do this thing. And, uh, and, and that's really hard to explain what goes through you, but you go into a zone and you don't think you blank everything else out. The cheer of the crowd, everything, until you get to that interview at the other end. John, let me take you back in time a little bit, because it's one thing to have nearly four decades of experience and be at the top of the top of the game, but it's another thing to be starting out. I mean, you just didn't walk out there and go in 330 miles an hour in four seconds. There was a, a certain progression to get you where you are today. Give me some, maybe some story early on when you first, uh, even your your start, that experience of getting getting to the point where you were really competing at the upper levels. It must have been quite an education to start to move up the ladder, so to speak. It was starvation. It was hawking everything I had. It was leaving my family behind for months, sometimes driving the 18-wheeler to get to the next race. I, I tell people, don't do it because you want to be famous. Don't do it because you want to be rich. You know, there uh, maybe a few will make it, but the majority don't. But if you do it out of love and a passion for speed, then it's then it all makes sense why you do it. But it has fed my family. It put my kids through college. Now they're, my whole family works in my business. Nobody works on the outside. My granddaughter, Autumn, is 12 years old. She's driving a junior dragster. And my two grandsons, they'll either be hockey players or, or maybe they'll be drag racers. My daughter married Graham Ray Hall. He's an IndyCar driver. We're here for the Indy 500 this weekend. Who knows where the future goes? We give them opportunities, get them an education, get them through college. You know what I'm saying? And like my girls, and, and that's what we do. But let me tell you something. A lot of burn centers I've been in, I've been on fire from here to Australia. But I've crossed America. I know America only by the interstates. I haven't seen half the cities. You know what I'm saying? You go into town, you do a race, you're back on the interstate. Now I'm back on an airplane. My team travels with, I think, 10 or 12, 18, 10, 18 wheelers with freight liners pulling them. And they live on the road. I've got 125 employees or close to it, 122. And uh, they live it. Got shops in California and shops in Indy. And uh, we build our own cars, build our own engines, paint our own cars. We do a little bit of everything. It's a great life. I can't complain. You know, John, you mentioned the fire a moment ago, and you made the line about I've been on been on fire from Australia to here. This is that you're going to be the only person on my podcast. And I've done over 500 uh, episodes. The first person, probably the only person, I'm going to ask this question, which is when you're on fire. What is the first thing that you've trained yourself to do when you're on fire? Well, first thing you train yourself to do is don't scream, don't don't open your mouth, don't suck in like oh my god because you're inhaling and you you'll smoke you'll suck fire right down your throat. I got burnt years ago because I went into panic in my early days, 40 years ago inhaled a lot of smoke and I talk hoarse to this day. I think it was because of the fire or maybe just because I talk too much. The bottom line on it is that you go into fight mode. You know what you have to do. You know, you don't hit your parachutes right away because the fire will burn them off. Uh, you, you, you've got to wait for the fire to burn down because usually it's a fuel explosion or, or oil and it'll usually burn off. But if the body catches on fire, then you've got to run away freight train. Now you've got to get on the fire bottles. Uh, it'll probably burn your chutes off. And then you've got to get this thing stopped because you're running out of ground real fast. At over 330 miles an hour, these things cover ground like you can't even imagine. Uh, on the brakes, not to burn the brakes out, 
car gets hopping on you, you got to let loose of the brake, and that's hard to do under the fear of pressure. But you got to blank out that fear. But probably as much experience as I have, the fear is still there. You never get rid of it. You just know how to go into fight mode, and that's what you do to protect yourself. You know, John, I've I've seen some accounts of your career early on, maybe this would be back in the 70s and 80s, where some peers, you know, they didn't necessarily give the best accounting of you. They would uh, perhaps say things and they weren't they weren't as complimentary to you and perhaps you weren't having the success then. What kept you going when you weren't winning early on? Well, first of all, I'm the kind of guy I don't let someone give me their opinion and direct me in the road of life. I do what I do. They only rekindled the fire if I was down because I burned a car to the ground at Memphis and I got out in the interview and said I saw Elvis at a thousand foot. Hell, I got more newspaper out of being on fire and talking about Elvis than winning the race. (laughs) And, and people, they love it. But, but if, if the competition don't like it, well, they, they were able to beat me up for the first 10 years. And then I beat them up for about 20. You got them in the long run, huh? You've got, what, more more uh, races, more victories than, than anybody, right? Yeah, but I don't look back on that. Now they're beating me up real good, but I'm going to turn it around. Uh, it, it goes through the goods and bads, the highs and lows. But no, I just, if, if someone aggravates me, it just, it just makes me work harder. That's the way my dad and mom taught me. I fight for what I want. I fight for my family. And old glory, the American flag. We got to fix this, the greatest country in the world. You mentioned your mom and dad. Let me let you go back even farther because they're, you know, I've seen accounting on your background and there's some, there's some interesting personal history, especially your personal physical history overcoming polio. Why don't you speak to that? Because I mean, as a young person, that's a really tough thing. I mean, kids are going to be tough on you, but you, again, the persistence seems to be right there with you at a very early age. Born in 1949. The vaccine for polio didn't even come out till the 50s. I think I got it when I was first starting to walk, one between one and two years old, and then I quit walking. They thought I had spinal meningitis, and uh, they took me to a doctor. I was up in the logging camps of Oregon, and they said, no, this guy's got polio. There was no cure then. Scalding hot baths with your legs underwater to get stimulation. And I went through that, and it was rough on my family. I don't even remember it. I was too small. Uh, they're doing a book on me now, and they tell about all that story. A lot of it was from my brother that witnessed it and, and what I went through. But, you know, part of life, you, you, you take what's thrown at you, and you keep fighting. So uh, now they're growing up. My mom was a cook. My dad was a truck driver. I was just a crazy kid wanting to play football, wear a helmet, and hear the cheer of the crowd and have the camaraderie of a team. And I got that in drag racing, still wear a helmet, still hear the cheer of the crowd, and still got the camaraderie of a team. Life couldn't get better. John, why why has this passion, this passion that you're giving on this call, why do we not see this across uh, America, frankly, other countries, what's what's happened today? What's happened to people today where they can't get excited, they can't have the passion? You're 68 years young, you sound like a teenager. What is wrong with society as a whole? How did we miss out on being, uh, you know, keeping that passion that you've got alive? What, what are we missing out on? Well, I know a lot of people, my daughters, my son-in-law, my teammates, my employees, they've all got passion. And so do all the other Guys and gals out there on on the interstates running the roads with these 18-wheelers going to these races, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of a, a, a lot of passion worldwide, but there's a lot of anger out there, and I don't know why. I know I have it some days, and I have to sit down and talk to myself and tell myself to straighten up. Life's good. A good Lord put us on this earth, and we got to work hard, take care of our families, and try to be good people. That's what I try to do. And But some days I even have problems. Some people get stuck in the mud for a long time. I don't allow it. I talk my way out. You know, you mentioned that you're going to the gym in a few minutes. When will you stop? Is is there any physical limitation that you see on yourself in the near future? Well, I'm, I'm not kidding myself. Father time's chasing me, or I'm chasing it. But bottom line, if I don't go to the gym, if I miss the gym, honestly, three days in a row, I go every other day. Some days I'll go five days in a row. Depends on my schedule. But my doctor said you'll never recover, uh, you know, uh, from being uh, in that hospital, you know, for almost two months. My body lost a lot of its memory. 
and you train yourself. If you were young, you, if you're 30, you pop right back. I was 58 going on 60, 56, whatever age I was when I crashed. But bottom line, I'll never recover. So if I don't keep going to the gym, exercising, and doing everything I need to do, weightlifting, uh, and, and trust me, I don't have no body of the Hulk. I ain't Superman, but I, but I keep my body's memory. I keep the motion going. I know guys half my age can't touch their toes. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I make sure that I can touch the ground every day. I don't want to just touch my toes. I want to know that I'm giving everything I can at my age. And it's tiring. There's some days when I'm done in a gym workout after two hours. I'll sit there for 30 minutes because it's like, man, just getting up's a job. But I love it. I keep my body in good shape. I keep my mind right. And I dream. And you get that energy up, get that blood pressure going, get off that couch, America. Don't sit there. Don't don't say you're old and use it for an excuse. Get up and go to work. And I know it's tough because I've had days that I remember being in the hospital crying and telling my wife, I can't do this. This is impossible. She goes, I know John Force better than that. I know you keep going. And I worked my way through it. And I ain't going back. So I'm going to go till I drop. Hopefully it'll, it won't be in a rocking chair. Even though that's a pretty good idea some days, it'll probably be on a racetrack somewhere in America. You know, you mismentioned dreaming. So with all this success that you've got under your belt, you know, four decades of success, what do you dream about these days? I, look, look, I own two car museums. I've got a big old house. I've got a place in Lake Tahoe. That's not the most important stuff to you, though, is it? No, none of it matters. Uh, it's nice to be able to get my family together and have a place for them to go and take a vacation at Christmas. Uh, i got sports cars that I don't even license and motorcycles. Don't have time to drive them. I drive my Chevrolet every day, my pickup truck. I love it. It's got my music in it. I still listen to the Beach Boys and country, and that, that's the world I live in. I wake up to go racing. That's what I do. And, I'm, you know, a lot of guys say, oh, man, we're on a four-run, four races in a row. That's going to be a real... You know, backbreaker, I love it because I get into the mode of fight, and I don't like to get out of it. I like to keep training, keep running, keep racing. I, I do it because I ain't no different than any – I ain't nothing special. I'm no different than NASCAR or IndyCar or or any kind of racing, uh, motorcycle racing. Uh, I'm just a guy that loves what I do, and I'm very lucky, very fortunate, and I've done it well. And I'm going to keep doing it well, and the day I can't, and maybe i got to get out of the seat, but not today. John, you, it's it's inspiring story. I mean, I look. I'm a, I'm a self made entrepreneur myself, but I love your story. I mean, you've got you've got a few years on me, but it's it's one of those things where when you hear someone that's ahead of you and they're they're nowhere close to giving in or quitting or stopping, uh, it's just a it's a motivating thing. And I think you know that it's motivating. And I think it's once you get to the point where you're at and you just you can't let go of the fight that. I, maybe that is the feeling that, that keeps every entrepreneur alive and dreaming, just that I'm going to keep doing it. You know, that's that thrill. We're given the opportunity, living in America, the greatest country in the world. I believe that even though it's got all its problems, it's still the greatest. Okay? And we all have to do our part. We've got to get up every day and go to work. We've got to entertain people. In all walks of life, whatever you do in a job, you have a reason. We do it for our families, and we do it for love. We have men and women in the military that are overseas fighting and giving their lives. And we got nothing to complain about. They're protecting us. The least we can do is support them and, and build this country back to what it needs to be. It's still the greatest in the world, but it can be a whole lot better, and I'm going to keep fighting for it. I'm looking across at the American flag right out in front of my building. I got the tallest flag pole the city to let me have. And I have to put a new flag on it twice a year. I got them out at my shop in California, American flag. People say, why do you spend that kind of money? Are you kidding me? To let everybody know that, that I'm an American and I'm proud of it. And we're a, we're a mixture of all kinds of people. And that's what makes us great. Only God knows where it's going to go, but I'm going to keep trying. John, I wish you the best of luck. And I tell you, I, I think you've motivated me and I'm sure you've motivated many of my audience that have not seen an NHRA funny car race in person to probably go find one now. I think everyone you're going to make several go find John Forrest and let's see him ride. Turn on your TVs. We're on Fox Sports. You can watch us every Sunday and on Saturday and Friday qualifying. A lot of the great TV produced in-house at NHRA uh, drag racing, mellow yellow drag racing. 
Hey, we're P.T. Barnum. We don't even have elephants, but P.T. Barnum don't have elephants no more. <laughs> we're the greatest show on earth. Come see us or watch us on Fox, and you'll be entertained. The ground will shake when you stand there on the start line uh, and, and uh, the rumble and the noise and uh, bring the families. They'll love it. We're all across America, 24 national events. I just say thank you for your show. You give a great interview. I love it. And yet you ask a lot of great questions. Like you said, you're building your own story. And uh, anytime you need me, all you got to do is call my PR. They'll find me somewhere. want to be on your show. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, sir. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.